Good, so happy Father's Day. I'm not going to keep you long today uh, because I am aware that some of you have lunches and different places you've got to be. Uh, but I want to share a word that I got on my heart a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a word that's probably true for all of us. Thank you, Tyler. You can go. Uh, thank you for playing. One of the interesting things about Father's Day, which I find interesting living in Australia, happens every year, it's for Bunnings ads. Every year, Bunnings uses this as an opportunity to, uh, you know, put their little ads in their little feeder things, because, you know, the gift of what you buy your dad is always probably a little bit difficult and a little bit complicated, isn't it? And the thing I, the problem I have with the Bunnings ad is this, is there is a connotation that every single dad in Australia is into DIY. It's by connotation, it's like every dad in Australia likes DIY. Every dad wants to do DIY. Now, I, I would just say this, all right, because they have this catch line. If they, they do it every year. If you haven't picked up on it, I, I love marketing and all that kind of stuff, so I always watch how they do it. And they say this line. Give dad some help with his DIY projects this Father's Day. It's the same line every year. They repeat the same line every year. Now, I want to just give you a little bit of help. Don't. <laughs> All right? Listen, not every dad should have power tools. I just want to help you out a little bit here, all right? Not every dad should have power tools. Not everyone should actually be engaging with power tools. Let me just tell you how I know this, all right? I know this for a number of reasons. The amount of people that I know that have had accidents in DIY projects is outstanding. It's, it's just like up there. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, none of you know what I'm talking about. I'll give you some statistics. Couldn't find a statistics from Australia, but I did find this from the UK. One in six Britons who have undertaken a DIY project at home in the last year have injured themselves. One in six, okay? Approximately 200,000 people every year in Britain are sent to hospital with DIY injuries. Every week in England, in the UK, 500 people are hospitalised and need surgery as a result of the contact with power tools. In the... Do you know over COVID, they saw a 47% rise in DIY-related injuries? And there's an 81% chance it's going to be a man. Do you know, there's a couple other things about DIY. There are some people that when they DIY, it would have been cheaper just to hire someone. Because after they've done what they, their DIY, they need to get someone else in to actually fix their DIY because they've made a problem worse and they've made this situation worse. And so they have to do it. So I've got this theory. I've got this theory. Don't help dad with his Father's Day projects. Don't encourage him. Either trying to bankrupt him or kill him. But either way, just love on your dad and don't help him when it comes to the Father's Day DIY projects. Now, I want to say this. I've also come to the conclusion in my life, I don't want to do it myself. I would much prefer if someone else do it for me. How many of you are with me? Why would I want to do that work? I'd prefer someone else to do it for me. That's the conclusion which I've arrived at. Now, there could be a reason for that. I have had my fair share of DIY disasters in my life. When we were first married, Jenny and I bought a house and uh, we bought a 1920s bungalow in Horsham Weatherboard Place and uh, I thought I could renovate because I'd seen it on TV. And if they can do it on TV, surely I could do the same. And so we started renovating this place and we had some great uh, incidences and things which happened. Uh, you know, I remember once I was trying to take out one of the internal chimneys and uh, someone said to me, all you do is you just take off like, you know, about that much and just push it over and it will slide down and it will go. In fact, that's not what happens. It actually caves straight through the tin and actually crashes down into your house. That's actually what happens if you want to know. On the same project, I found this as I was knocking it out, this kind of weird pipe coming up and it was kind of going to the side and I was like, oh, I'll just get my angle grind and just angle grind it off. But for some reason, curiosity got the better of me and it was capped and so I undid the cap and there was a piece of cork stuck in there really, really tight and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. So I went and got some pliers and I got the cork out and on that day, I did discover that our house was connected to gas and that, um, yeah, when they said to me it was was and it actually was and yeah, praise God that I got curious enough to actually do it. I had all these DIY designs. I remember pulling off because it was an old 1920s weatherboard, they used to put Hessian sacks 
onto the walls and then they plaster it. And I didn't realise how thick it was, but it's probably like that thick in places. It weighs a lot. And I started pulling it off the wall. And I kind of like, it was pulling off quite well and it was staying in one big piece. So I've done a wall probably from here to this curtain away. I've done that much so far and there's a bit more to go. And I didn't realise that when it hit that critical point, it was all going to come away. And about 200 kilos was going to land on top of me and I was going to be pinned to the floor like this with my arms out like this. And I had to do the worm to get out from under. It was like sitting under a weighted blanket. I've had my fair share of do I buy disasters. I remember doing doors, and I, I've done this. This isn't my photo, but this is exactly what I have done. If you could just show the photo. The problem. Can anyone see the problem? It's when you stick the door upside down and you cut out the hole and you put the thing there. So then if you turn it around, the problem that you've got is you're opening the door up down here. I've done that many, many times. I don't know how many times I've done it. I've learned one thing. Sometimes it's just cheaper to actually go and get someone else to do it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We can all laugh at the DIY because we've all been there. We've all got it wrong. We've all made mistakes. And we've all done things which we think, wow, why did I do that? So I'm going to look at today, what are you building? One of the biggest differences I found that when it came to DIY is this. It was far better not to do it myself, but to have someone next to me who's done it before, who could guide me and lead me on how to do it successfully. I just found it was so much more helpful than doing it myself. Because at times, I had no idea of what I was doing. Now, we now live in the YouTube generation. Who, like, who loves YouTube? Who loves, this is what I do. If I want to do something, I go on YouTube, I watch how someone does it, and then I see, okay, do I think I am competent enough still to do this? And if not, I'll get a professional. But if I can see it, I'll do it. And we live in this YouTube generation where there's people inspiring us, helping us, leading us, kind of showing us how to actually navigate the projects and the things which we want to do. And I think it's a great metaphor for life. I think it's a great understanding piece for life. All of us are doing life by ourselves at the moment, and and we're giving it a shot. We may not know what we're doing. We may not know where we're going. We may not know what we're trying to build. But here is the truth. Every single day of your life, you are building something. You are building something in your health. The decisions that you make today around your health and what you eat and whether you exercise and all kinds of decisions that you make each and every day are ultimately building something for your life. All right? It's building something. Financially, it's the same. Each and every decision you make, if you decide that every morning you're going to have five or six coffees at the coffee shop, it's making a financial decision that later on in life is going to play out. Is there's going to be an outcome because you are building your life. In relationships, each and every day, we are making choices and decisions, which is building our relationships. So the question becomes, what are you building? Does your life have a plan or purpose? Are you building towards something with intent or is it cobbled together by accident? And I find scripture really, really interesting when it talks about this process around building because there's a lot of metaphors which is used which helps us understand that we are actually all building our lives. Each and every one of us today is making choices and decisions which is gonna build our lives. And the principles of building generally apply to what we are doing in our life. Now, the first thing you need to know about buildings is this, is all buildings come with a cost. You know, if you go to Bunnings, I'm picking on Bunnings today. I, I do love them. I do shop there. But, you know, you know, when you go to Bunnings and you go to walk out, what's the, what's the thing that happens? No, it's not. No, we're not there yet. The sausage isn't there yet. There's always that person at the front of the, the front door. And what have they got? They got the scanner. And they want to scan your receipt, they want to see the, you know, what you got, and they want to do that. Now, even worse, how many of you have done this? You actually park your car inside. How many of you made that fatal mistake? How many of you know the tension as they're going through your boot and it feels like you're being searched like you're a drug mule could bring in drugs from, I don't know, Colombia, and they kind of go through the back of your car and they're looking at everything and they're moving stuff out the way and you get, I get really nervous under that. I don't know why, I get nervous like I've done the wrong thing. I've done nothing wrong, but I get really, really nervous. It, haven't you? You've got a trusting face, Dave, you see. That's what it is. It must be something about me. But, you know, as you go through, there's a cost which you have to pay. No building comes without a cost. 
No building actually comes without there being a cost. It costs you. Every decision you make has a cost for today and also for tomorrow. Jesus, when he talked about following him, said that it actually costs you something. In Luke 14, he says this, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to to finish. Jesus was saying this, he was saying that each and every one of us need to be prepared to pay the cost for what the future is going to look like. It's a decision that we make each and every day. It's better not to start something. It's better not to start than to go halfway through and not finish. You know, Jesus described it like this, carrying a cross. It was hard, it's difficult, it's self-sacrificing, but we do it because we do it for a reason. And the reason is this, it's very, very simple, is that we believe that what we are setting and what we are doing is worth it in the end. Now, there's a really important principle that I want to talk about. It's about how well we know ourselves. Most of us in this room would say, I know myself pretty well. I need to, you know, I know know what will make me happy. I know what will make me contented. I know, and sometimes we need to let go of that thought. Sometimes we need to let go of that thought. In fact, I would say in psychological literature, the more you read about how well you know yourself and know what would please you, you would find some very interesting things, which leads me to the next thing. The Bible speaks about is when we build our lives, what foundation will you build on? Now, you can't build, I've known this uh, well enough, that you can't build anything beyond what your foundation will permit. Whatever foundation you build is going to be the thing that's going to hold back what you can actually build. If you, if you don't build a strong enough foundation, if you don't get it right at the foundational level, whatever you build on top of it is always going to be at risk. And most people really don't think about the foundations of their life. What is your foundation? Have you laid the right foundation? Most people are building on the wrong foundations of what they think will make them happy. Dan Gilbert is a professor of psychology at Harvard. And he wrote this book, it's a very, very good book, called Stumbling on Happiness. And uh, it's probably a combination of all the studies that have been done on people and their personal quest to find personal happiness. And he called the book Stumbling on Happiness because he, 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 he has some really interesting ideas that most of us have zero idea, and most studies show this, have zero idea what will make us happy. We have a presumption of what will make us happy, but we actually don't know what will make us happy. This is how he describes it. Most people project their present feelings and circumstances to predict how they will feel tomorrow and what, will they, what they will want then, right? So this is what happens for most of us, okay? And a very simple way to explain it to you is this, is that have you ever been food shopping when you're hungry? Who's been food shopping when you're hungry? Do you know what it's like when you go food shopping when you're hungry? And you're walking down the aisle and you see the blocks of chocolate and you think, oh, gee, I better get some. You grab four blocks of chocolate and then there's the chicken wings and you go, oh, gee, I'm going to grab the big pack and then I'm going to grab this and then I'll grab that and then I'll grab this and grab that. And you get home and the next day you go and you look at all the food in your house and you go, why did I buy all that? What was going on? You see, what happened was, is in the past, you were trying to, you thought, oh, well, I'm just going to predict what I'm going to feel like tomorrow. I'm going to feel the same way tomorrow, but we actually don't. And so this is the number one reason why it says most of us are terrible at actually predicting and understanding how we actually bring happiness and joy into our lives. The second thing which he tells us, which is really, really interesting, is that we always imagine and fail to realize that we will feel different once things happen. Once things happen in your life, you think that something is going to change fundamentally to make you feel different. But most studies show this, is that no matter what you think will make you happy in the future, when you arrive there, you will find you don't feel any different at all. This is the number one, one of the, he says this is the number one cause of most people's unhappiness. 
So you can think to yourself, oh, if I only get that job promotion, I will feel different and I'll feel better and I'll feel successful and I'll feel this. If only my business grows, if only this relationship improves, if only I meet that financial goal, if only I buy a boat, if only I buy a car, if only I do this, if only I do that, if only this happens and when that happens, I will feel successful and completed. I'll feel like, yeah, that's, that's what I was after. But the reality is for most people, when they arrive at those points, it's actually disheartening. Now, I know this for a fact because I remember when I was young and uh, got saved, the only thing I wanted to do was be a youth pastor. That was like my greatest goal in life is to be a youth pastor. I was like, I just want to be a youth pastor and serve God. And I was like, that was the pinnacle of my life. I thought once I hit that, my life would be complete. I could die, go be with Jesus. There was nothing left for me to live. I I made it. I'd done everything that God wanted in my life. I remember my very first day of being a youth pastor. And I sat in my office behind my terrible desk it was out of kilter and it would wobble like that and, then, and it was one of those old office desks and I sat behind it and I actually thought to myself, this is nothing what I thought it would feel like. I thought that I'd have this great feeling of contentment and, and actually it disillusioned me. I actually felt disillusioned. On the day that I thought, here's everything that I ever wanted, I actually felt disillusioned because I realised that nothing had changed inside of me. I didn't feel anything. And so many times in life, what people are doing is trying to chase happiness around what they think, but when they have that experience, find out that it's not actually all it's cracked up to be. Dan Gilbert writes it like this. He says, in our lifelong pursuit of happiness, most of us have the wrong map. That's how he describes it. Most of us have a map which we think will make us happy. If we follow this blueprint and we follow this way, it's going to make us happy. But he says most of us find out through life experience that the map we have is actually wrong that leads to our happiness. So if we're in such terrible judges of how do we actually find out what makes us happy or gives us joy or brings us fulfillment in life, how do we navigate that? Now, as Christians, Here's the, here's the beautiful thing. We believe that we were created by God, made and knit together in our mother's womb, and he created us for a reason and for a purpose. God knows us better than we know ourselves. We think we know ourselves. He knows you far better. He knows what makes you happy. He knows what brings you contentment. He knows, understands your peace. He understands everything about you in your life. And the beautiful thing is, is that that there, that there is the foundation that you can build your life on. When you think you know what What's going to make you happy? You're probably a terrible judge, but the one who made you knows what's going to bring fulfillment, joy, peace, a life of purpose and fulfillment. And so here's the thing, we can do, do it ourselves or we can have someone come alongside and say, hey, let me help you and show you on how to live your life. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, we read this, uh, the couple of passage er- earlier last week, but it says this, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be recorded, rewarded according to their own labour. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace that he has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, he's built, talking here to a church body, but what he's saying is this. He's saying, hey... There's only one foundation for your whole life, and that's the person and work of Jesus Christ. When I came to you, he uses the word here in the Greek, architect. He says, I was like an architect. I gave you a blueprint. I gave you a plan. I gave you something to build off, which was going to make sense for your life. And now it's up to you on how you build off of that. So you can, there's no other place you can put your trust, your hope, your belief, your convictions. Put it in me because God knows you better than you know yourself. And if you start off with the principle of this, that God, you know me better, you know me better than I know myself, it's the starting point to build your life and to build a foundation for your life moving forward into the place where you want to end up. Now, Can I say this? The foundation for my whole life has been not what I think, not what I feel, not what I kind of understand because I've worked out that I'm terrible at bringing myself completeness or happiness or joy or peace, all these things. But I have found this, that I put my trust in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, believed in him, that he knew me. 
He knows what fulfills me. He knows what brings me joy. He knows how to bring me peace to my life. And when I put my trust in that fundamental principle first, and that was the foundation for my life, not to do it myself, but to trust in him, something shifted in my life. And something can shift in your life today, but that's the foundational principle that you have to have to build off. And if you're not convinced of that today, and sometimes I meet Christians who are not convinced of that, that God does not have your best intentions at heart, that he doesn't really want you to be happy or joyful or filled with peace. No, my friends, that's the lie of the enemy. The only good thing God has, he has only good for you. He has only blessing. He has only fulfillment. He only has joy. But sometimes we battle in our minds because we think we know better and we can do it ourselves when we need someone to guide us and lead us. And that's what the Holy Spirit helps us to do in life. He gives us a great foundation and a point to build off, all right? And when we build off the revelation of his love, we then build on his teaching. In Matthew 7, Jesus says this. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, all right? Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against this house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on a sand, a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. You always build from a solid position. And when you begin to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe what you want for my life. I believe that you have the best way for my life. And then you begin to take his teachings and apply his teachings to your life. You begin to build not only a foundation, but you begin to build your life from the ground up into everything that God's wanted it to be. And you build it in a way that's solid. That's why so many people in life don't go through life well because they have no solid conviction and a baseline for what we're gonna build their their life on. And so when the problems of life come, the difficulties of life come, the challenges of life come, they have no foundation to actually build. But when you build on the revelation of who Jesus is, his love for you, and then you build on his teachings, what it actually does is it builds your life in a way that will be sustained, a way that will keep building, a way that at the end when storms come and problems come and difficulties come, you will be found standing. That's the beauty of the message of Jesus Christ that he came to help you. I spoke earlier about the advantages of YouTube. When you don't know what to do, you can go on, you can learn from someone else on how to build and they show you how to do it. And you know, today you can be in this room and you've got no clue on how to run your life, no clue on how what brings you peace, no clue on how to actually improve your life. But here's a beautiful thing, you don't need to because Jesus Christ wants to come alongside you and stand there and give you a foundation, not only just a foundation, but a way to build your life to give it purpose, meaning. Because the horrible truth is we don't know how to do it ourselves and if you trust in him he will actually show you the way see I love what the teaching of Jesus is these are the things that Jesus teaches he teaches us that from the smallest faith something incredible can grow he teaches us the value of the individual, even if that one is away from the 99. He teaches us how to forgive. He teaches us to love our neighbour and to do unto others as we would have them do to us. He teaches us blessed are peacemakers. He teaches us to love our enemy. He teaches us to give us more than what's demanded. He teaches us that true riches are more than material things. He teaches us not to worry about material needs because he has it. He teaches us that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He teaches us not to judge others. He teaches us not to be self-righteous. He teaches us that blessed of the merciful for they will be shown mercy. He teaches us to serve others in humility. He teaches us to deny ourselves. He teaches us to love the poor and brokenhearted. He teaches us that we are to be wise stewards of the talents that God has given us in life. He teaches us that there is a kingdom to come where every injustice will be struck down. He teaches us to look forward to the day when we see him again and to be wise in how we live until then. He wants to teach you on how to build your life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to help you build your life, not just on a revelation of who he is, but then build through his principles and teaching and show you how to get the life that you want. I'm going to finish in a few moments. Tyler, can you come back wherever you are? He's here somewhere hiding out. In the Bible, in Acts chapter 20, I 
And if you don't know the, the book of Acts, the book of Acts is really just the story of a New Testament church, of what was going on in the New Testament church. And it's an incredible book because it talks about the spread of the gospel. And there's a man named Paul, and Paul is an ardent hater of Christianity, persecuting Christians out to get them. And one day on the road to Damascus, he has this incredible encounter with God. And this encounter with God changes his life. He basically flips sides. He goes from hating Christ, hating the message of Jesus, to promoting promoting and preaching and teaching the message of Jesus, incredible transformation in his life. He then is probably the main per, uh, person that goes out and spreads the gospel. And uh, he, he goes to all kinds of different places. And he goes to one place called Ephesus. He spends a uh, considerable amount of time there. And Ephesus is one of the churches which he deeply loves. He probably had one of the deepest impacts of his whole life in this place called Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 20, he stops at a place and he calls the Ephesian elders across to him. He says, I want you to come meet with me and they come across and they meet with him. And, and it's an incredible story. I love it. One of the most moving passages of Scripture, I think in the whole Bible, because Paul is there and he says, I'm going to Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit's warned me that all awaits me is prison and hardship. How would you like it if the Holy Spirit told you that? <laughs> all that awaits me is prison and hardship. He knew exactly what he was going. Just as Jesus, when Jesus was going to Jerusalem, knew that he was going to be persecuted, handed over, crucified and died. Paul is saying the same. He's saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I know what's going to happen. I know what's, uh, this is the end. He says to them, you will not see me again. He says, I'm, I'm done. You're not going to see me again. You're only going to see me in heaven. You're not going to see me on earth again. This is it. This is my last time with you. And he gives a defense of his ministry. He talks about everything that he's done amongst them, the way he's lived. And it's quite an emotional meeting because he's saying, this is it. I love you guys, this is it, but this is it. This is the last time I'm ever gonna see you on this earth. I know what's happening. This isn't an accident. I know I'm going there. I know I'm gonna, my life's gonna finish and you guys are gonna go on. And he says this incredible scripture. I think it's one of the most incredible scriptures that we find in the New Testament. In verse 32 of Acts 20 says this, Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He says, this is my last time with you. This is it. I'm not going to see you again. But what I'm going to leave you with is this. I'm going to leave you with the word of His grace which can build you up. He says, I'm not leaving you with, I'm not, but I'm leaving you this word. And this word, if you follow this word and you build your life around the word, if you, if you get this into your heart, it will build you up and it's gonna build your life and you're gonna be fine. And, and I love the picture of this. This is the last time, the last opportunity, but he knows this, that this can build you. I want to tell you today, the Word of God is powerful to build your life. It's powerful to change you. It's powerful to transform your thinking. It's powerful to transform everything about your life. I want to tell you this, that if you give yourself over to this Word and the words of Jesus Christ and you allow it to change you and you allow it into your heart and you live it, it will radically change everything about you, your circumstances around you, how you live life, how you do things. Everything will change if you commit yourself to this. And this is what Paul Paul says, I commit this to you. It's the way of life. It's a way of health. It's a way of you being fulfilled beyond your wildest dreams. It's a way of you having life altogether. And I commit it to you. Hey, you might be here today. You're a Christian. I want to speak to Christians first. You might be a Christian. First of all, are you convinced of the love of God, that God loves you? He understands you better than you understand yourself. Maybe you've been trying to do it yourself, work out what will make you happy. You're a terrible judge. You're never going to get it right. Can I suggest to you today that you surrender to Him afresh and say, God, I want you to actually help me to understand what will bring me fulfillment, joy and peace because it may not look like what I think like. Secondly, I want to build my life on your word, not on what I think and my opinions and my thoughts, but I want to build it on your word so that what I build actually doesn't get knocked by the storms and the challenges of life, but it stands firm through every season and every time. If you need to return back to just trusting and believing that He loves you and He cares for you this morning, can you do that? You might be hearing you're not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus. Can I encourage you today? Can I encourage you today? 
Just go read psychological books around happiness, for starters. Don't believe my word. Every psychologist, they will say this. We're terrible at working out what makes us happy. It's not even a biblical thing because we don't know ourselves. And you might be in this place today and you've never become a follower of Jesus. And I want to say this to you. He knows you. Better than you know yourself. And you might be trying to do things and you go, well, that will make me happy and that will make me happy. And a lot of the times it's going to lead down roads where you're going to find unfulfillment, not knowing who you are, confusion, mess, problems, difficulties, anxiety. That word anxiety, why why do we live in an anxious generation? We live in an anxious generation because people don't know who they are, what they're called to be. And they're unsettled in their spirit. And you might be here and you, maybe that's a problem for you. And that can be one of the reasons. But when you come to God, and you say, God, show me who I am. Show me what will fulfill me. Help me to build my life. He wants to show you how to build your life, how to have a life with purpose and meaning. And just in the last few moments we've got in this service today, we're going to close in just one minute. Maybe we can just close our eyes. If you're here today, Christian, non-Christian, but this morning you just want to say, Lord, I don't want to do it myself. I want to put my trust in you. You created me. You love me. You care for me. And this morning I want to put my trust in you that you will actually show me, Lord, how to build my life. And if you want to do that this morning, can I just get you, just quickly lift your hands. Thank you, see that hand. Thank you, see that hand. Is anyone else this morning? Thank you, see that hand. You can drop your hands now. I'm going to pray for you real quick before we end the service. Father, I thank you today. Lord, in your goodness and your grace and your deep care and love for every one of us, continually want to show us, Lord, how we should live our life for you. I thank you, God, in the things and the confusion and the mess that, Lord, we would actually just trust in you. Bring us back to a place of believing in you, that you have your best intentions for us. But, Lord, you want to guide us and lead us on how to live life through your word. And, Father, I pray your grace on us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Awesome.